talking about the imaging of, of Chiari malformations, and when, when you have a topic that's this broad, there's always uh, a choice, I guess. You can go very deep into one, one issue, or you can go very broad. And, and in this, this talk, I'm, I'm going to go very broad and very basic. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about um, modalities for imaging Chiari mal malformations. I'm going to talk a little bit about CT, a little bit about, about MR, and then I'm going to transition a bit, talk about just basic anatomy just to make sure that we're all on the, on the same page because I, I often get the feeling when talking to uh, patients and sometimes clinicians that we're not, not all on the same page when it comes to anatomy. Then I'm going to show a lot of examples basically and, the, and that'll be it. And I'm a radiologist so I like pictures so this is the last slide that's not going to have a picture on it and that won't have a majority of pictures on it. So this is, this is a CT scan, and I'm gonna start off with this even though we don't use it very often to image Chiari malformations because it's very easy to conceptually understand what a CT scan is. It basically images density. So a tissue that's very dense, like your skull, is gonna be one color. Tissue that's less dense, like the brain parenchyma, is going to be more gray. And tissue that's very, very um, uh, light, like water, is going to be, is gonna have a, a relatively lower number which translates into a darker color on the CT scan. And, and this is very easy to understand. Denser is white, uh, lighter, or, um, uh, less dense is black. Okay. So why would you want to get a CT scan? And, and, and this, this modality came around, uh, came about around the same time as the MR scanner. So what you, but we still get them. And the reason we get them is that they're very fast. And um, when I talk to medical students, they don't understand how, how much of a pro this is for a CT scan. For anybody that's been in an MRI scanner for an hour can understand why, why this is very, very attractive. That we can image on a modern scanner, the whole body can be Im imaged in less than a minute, and your, your head and cervical spine much, much faster than that. These can also be done in patients with, with electronic devices. So not just pacemakers, old people can't get MRIs, but young people too, cochlear implants, uh, spinal stimulators of, of any type, vagal nerve stimulators. So any of those people have to go through um, either disconnections or removals. They can't get an uh, MRI, but they can get a CT scan with no problem. There's no safety questionnaire for a CT scan. But there are cons, and uh, for, the first con is radiation, and this is especially um, uh, concerning in kids. Getting a CAT scan now and then is okay, but many of the, the, the children that we image have chronic diseases, and they would be they would be getting CAT scans uh, very frequently, and we're always concerned about the risks of radiation and the possibility of developing cancers later on in life. Um, and we can, never, we can never tell someone for sure exactly how much that risk is elevated, but we know that it is. Uh, and the, the second uh, issue is more pertinent here. The, the tissue contrast from a CT scanner is pretty poor. Uh, we can tell bone versus brain, but we can't tell gray matter, which is on the outside, versus white matter, which is on the inside, because they're very close to each other in density, so they're going to be very close to each other in uh, color on the CT scanner. So, so this is the, the problem we have. We're imaging Chiari malformations, and we can't tell where the cerebellum is. Everything is grayed out. The, uh, the fluid is somewhere back here. The cerebellum is up here. Where does it end? Nobody knows. It doesn't always turn out this way. Sometimes a routine CT scan is good enough, and it's very hard to know when we're going to get a picture like this and we're, when we're going to get, get a picture like this. It has to do with the size of the person. This is a larger person, so we image the, the tissue contrast more poorly. This is a smaller per person, so we, we image it better. The CT scanner is also very automated. It controls how much dose it's going to give to the patient based on, on numerous factors, how, how heavy the patient is, some internal sensing mechanisms. So sometimes the CT scan is good enough and we can see the cerebellar tonsils wrapping around the, the brain stem here and we can, we can even get a pretty good measurement of how, how low they go here. We can improve the resolution of, of a CT scan uh, with contrast material. And uh, here we're injecting uh, contrast into the CSF and contrast that we use is very dense. It's almost as dense as brain on the CT scanner. And so now here we, even though the, the tissue contrast isn't great here, we've provided our contrast and now we can, we can make a, a pretty good measurement of exactly where the cerebellar tonsils are. Downside of this is you have to get a spinal tap and nobody wants to do that if they can avoid that. 
And this is called a CT myelogram. If someone ever offers that to you, that's what that looks like. So switching now to MRI. And MRI is, is a, a space age technology, I guess. We get exquisite soft tissue contrast. And I'm gonna talk about three sequences. The two main sequences that you're gonna see in radiology reports are T1 weighted and T2 weighted. And these days we're using probably 10 different sequences per study. But these are the bread and butter sequences. And I'm not gonna go at all into the, the technical factors of what, how you get these or how, how exactly um, they're derived. It's a surefire way to, to put medical or radiology residents to sleep is to talk about the physics that goes, that goes behind all of this. I think that a better way of thinking of these sequences is to, to think about what shows up on each sequence. And when I say what shows up, I mean what, what's bright? This is brighter than that. This is brighter than that. So let me start talking about T1. Or T, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about T2, I guess. So what's bright on T2? On T2, the things that are bright are, are, are CSF, or any, any liquid fluid, I guess. CSF, so in the ventricles, here we have lateral ventricles, and you can see that there's fluid in the cerebral sulci here. And the other thing that's bright on T2 is fat. And the two places we have fat in the brain are, are in the head. Uh, the subcutaneous fat, which is this rim of signal around the, the outside of the head. And we also have a little bit of, of fat in the marrow. So bone marrow has fat in it, and that turns out to be bright on, on a T2-weighted sequence. T1's a little bit more difficult. Uh, fat is also bright on T1, and you can see that the rim of, of high signal around the whole head is, is bright, so that's fat. Other things that are bright on T1, hemoglobin. So when you have a, either a blood clot or a hemorrhage, any kind of blood turns out pretty bright, and this is, this is a bleed in the brain. Uh, a few other things are also bright, and I'm not, this, this list is incomplete, but the most common is contrast material. And if you get a contrast-enhanced study, what we're looking for is things that turn up bright on a T1-weighted sequence. For a Chiari malformation, it turns out not to make that much difference, so I'll, I'll leave that off right there. This is the, the third sequence I'm going to talk about, and I think Dr. Keating touched on this briefly. This is called a, a CSF flow study. Some people call it a phase contrast study. And what we're, we're looking at here is we're, we're basically thinking about what does CSF do. And um, CSF pulses with every cardiac, with every heartbeat, I guess. The CSF all through the body, body pulses, and it, it doesn't move as much as blood, but it moves a little bit. And we can, we can sense that motion of, of cerebrospinal fluid with a special sequence. And what we're seeing here is, uh, here's the head, here's the, the brain stem, uh, cervical spinal cord, and none of these things are moving, right? These are cells, it's, it's a piece of tissue, nothing's moving. But the CSF is moving, and uh, the, the, the bright signal here is anything, basically, that moves toward us. So this is moving out of the screen towards us. And then when it's black, it's moving away from us. So with every cardiac pulsation, we can see the CSF moving toward us, away from us, toward us, away from us. And this is all uh, synchronized with the heartbeat. So we get a very nice uh, kind of picture of the heartbeat and, we, and the CSF pulsing back and forth. So let's look at the spine, uh, at the CSF. So here we have uh, the CSF in front of the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord, and this is the CSF in front of the spinal cord. And you can see that it's either black or all white at the same time. It's pulsing in sync because it's all connected. So let's look at behind the spinal cord. And there's less fluid behind the spinal cord, and that's normal. But we can see that it's white here, and then it turns black, and it's pulsing in sync with the fluid in front of the spinal cord. Again, because there's no obstruction, it's all in sync. Let's go up further here. And we're, we're coming up here into the fourth ventricle, and this arrow is showing the fourth ventricle. And there's not as much fluid in the fourth ventricle, and it's more distant. But you can still see that when the fluid is white here, it's white there. When it's black here, let's get it black. White, white, black, black. It's pulsing in the same phase. So again, we're showing that there's no obstruction in this patient. This patient, for some reason, got a CSF flow study. They don't have a Chiari malformation. That's what it's supposed to look like when it's normal. It's a patient with a Chiari malformation. Uh, so uh, this is the prepontine cistern. This is the cervical spine. We can see the fluid is relatively fine in front. When it's, all black, when it's black, it's all black. When it's white, it's all white. And behind, we see uh, fluid pulsing in sequence with the anterior CSF spice, space. And here we see the obstruction. We look at the fourth ventricle, and we don't see any pulsation of, of fluid at all. And this is, this is the obstruction that we look for in a, in a CSF flow study. 
I'm going to uh, switch gears again, uh, do some just very basic anatomy so that we're all on the same page when I show the examples of pathology. So this is a sagittal T1-weighted sequence, and this is a standard sequence. Almost every MRI has this sequence. And what we're looking at here is the mid-sagittal section. This is when you're looking at a person from the side, the very middle of the brain. And there are a few structures here that are very important uh, for diagnosing QR malformations later. Uh, and these structures don't exist when you're off the, the midline. So th the most important for me, the, the one I look at, is the pituitary stalk, which is right here. And the pituitary stalk is only a millimeter or two thick. So if you're off midline even a little bit, you won't see this. And this is a very important uh, marker to tell you that you're right in the midline. Uh, we also have the corpus callosum, which is the large um, fiber tract that connects the cerebral hemispheres. And, and this is a very common abnormality in uh, Chiari patients, uh, the midbrain tectum, which, will, which becomes very, later, very important later on when we try to distinguish Chiari malformations from each other. Um, here we have the straight sinus. This is just a, a blood vessel, and it, like the pituitary stalk, this is an important marker for the midline, so that we know when we're measuring the tonsils that we're actually measuring the midline. Um, then we have the clivus, which is a triangular bone, and the occipital bone, and here is the frame and magnum, and this is the line below which we're measuring. The, how far the tonsil falls. Okay. Uh, this is just an axial image through that skull base where the, where the brain meets the cervical spine. And the, the two structures that we look at here are the brain stem, which should be a nice circular structure, and it should have CSF all the way around it, which, remember, is, is bright on the T2. And we have two black dots there right next to it. And these are the vertebral arteries. And, um, it's important because these can sometimes be compressed when there's a Chiari malformation. So we always want to make sure that we can see those black dots and the, the vessels are, are there. Okay. So typical Chiari malformation, we've already seen many examples of this. We measure from the clivus to the occiput and we draw a perpendicular line. And greater than five millimeters, we call a Chiari malformation. And that works really well in adults, not, not as well in children. Um, in children, we allow maybe even up to a centimeter. Dr. Keating was talking about how difficult it is to separate normal children with low-lying tonsils from, from uh, true Chiari patients. It's important to, to notice that, that we're measuring from the, the verge of the bones. And we can see that there's bone marrow signal here and marrow signal here, but that's not where the bone ends. It ends down here. And you see this a lot. You see uh, patients being brought in and they have, sometimes they, they have even wax pencils where someone made the measurement up here. And they're not really measuring the frame and magnum. The bone actually extends way down here to where the, the black line ends. So that's really the measurement that you should be making. So don't do that. <laughs> right, so this is just an example of a Chiari 1 malformation. We've already seen a few of them. Uh, the tonsils extrude down posterior to the, to the um, to the spinal cord, and this is a close-up. And some people call these peg-like tonsils. It doesn't look like a peg to me. It looks like something's kind of squeezing through, like a pastry bag. Um, and we see the, the narrowing of the, of the canal. Um, uh, we've talked a little bit, a bit about hydrocephalus. Remember the, the normal ventricular size. They should, they should come to nice little points here and here. And we see the hydrocephalus where the ventricles are really getting dilated. Remember that corpus callosum that we saw? This is the large motor tract of the, of the uh, or a large tract that, sep that combines their, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that connects the two hemispheres. It's not the only tract that connects the two hemispheres, but it's the largest. And we can see that this dysgenesis of the corpus callosum that, that's also fairly common with Chiari malformations. And again, you see this on the mid-sagittal section, normal Chiari malformation. Okay. And then remember, we were talking about how the, the brainstem should look with the CSF all around it, nice oval or circle here. And here we see it being compressed by this tonsil that it's, that's extruding down. We see the, the CSF is almost gone. Uh, we don't see the vertebral arteries very much. We can see this vertebral artery compression in certain patients. And we'll see, about, uh, we'll, we'll see some of the consequences of, of this later on. Again, Chiari. One, this is a congenital fusion of an upper cervical vertebrae. These are incredibly common. I think these are, these are massively underreported. Uh, uh, the, the speaker before me was showing a case of, of, uh, of uh, Chiari 1 mal malformation. I'm not sure if, if there are numerous 
fusions like this. You see them all the time. They generally don't cause many symptoms, so they're, they're not recognized. But it's a nice corroborating feature when you do see it. You can see the, the vertebrae here is fused to the one below it. I'm switching to KRE2. And uh, I showed the, the midbrain tectum before in the, on, the, on the, um, the normal anatomy slide. And that was a little sliver that went this way. It looked like a little comma. Uh, in a Chiari one malformation, nothing happens to that tectum. It looks like a nice comma shape. And I use a beak, this is called a beaked tectum. When the, the, the posterior fossa is being pulled down, this kind of gets pulled up. And you see this come to a point. And, and I think this is probably the most useful feature of separating a Chiari one for a Chiari, from a Chiari two, is this beak tectum. And basically, that's just a marker of the cerebellum being pulled down. And here's another. Uh, example of beak tectum, they all look very similar. You shouldn't see the, the midbrain coming to a point like that. Okay. Another sign of a steep, of a Chiari II malformation, the very steep temptorium, the, the torcula, which is the, where the, the main veins of the brain come together, is very low, and this, this boundary between the, the cerebrum and the cerebellum is very, very steep. This is an older patient with a Chiari that apparently wasn't treated. And we can see the tonsils, and they're very atrophic. And this, this happens so um, very frequently in, in patients that, that are unsuspected and come in with a Chiari malformation. And it's thought that possibly that compression of the vessels gradually makes the cerebellum atrophic and kind of cures itself if you're willing to wait that long. Okay. Uh, this genesis of the corpus callosum is one of the most common malformations of, of uh, any, basically, syndrome, and we see it all the time in Chiari 1, Chiari 2, many other syndromes. So again, we see dys dysgenesis of that corpus callosum, again, in a, a beak tectum. So this is our Chiari 1 patient. So we have hydrocephalus, and this is our Chiari 2 person, and again, we have hydrocephalus. There's one distinguishing feature here. Uh, in the Chiari 1 malformation, you see this the septum pellucidum, this is the dividing septum between the two lateral ventricles. And the reason that we have the, the hydrocephalus in Chiari 1, as some, some people mentioned before, is that it's just a segmentation anomaly, and the hydrocephalus is a result of obstruction. In Chiari 2, it's a, it's a much more involved uh, disease that involves neural progression and neurulation, and so you actually lose developmental structures that should be there like that septum pellucidum, so it's not just a regular hydrocephalus. Here we're getting into more serious consequences of, of Chiari 2 malformations, again, because this is a disease of, of neural development, not just segmentation. And uh, here we have normal gyri in the front here, and, and back here you have these very abnormal looking uh, cerebral gyri, and this is called stenogyria or narrow gyri. This is also a very common thing to see. This is probably one of the, the most severe uh, manifestations of Chiari 2. We don't see this very often, and the finding is just this little blip right there. Again, since Chiari 2 is a, is a disorder of, of neurulation, uh, sometimes we get what's called gray matter heterotopia. During development, the gray matter uh, basically starts off near the ventricle and then migrates out to the periphery here, and sometimes that's stopped, and you get a little bit of gray matter of the cerebral cortex stuck near the ventricles. And sometimes this is responsible for very, very severe seizure disorders, and this can can completely uh, overshadow all the other symptoms of, of uh, Chiari. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and just talk about syringomyelia. And uh, mainly I wanted to show this. This is a prominent central canal. This is so, so common uh, and sometimes mistakenly called syringomyelia. This is a patient that was imaged for pimple on the, on the skin. And uh, so along with that, you get a cervical spine, but I'm just, pointing that out to, to show that this patient has no symptoms, basically. This is, there's no pain, you can see a nice spine, and incidentally, they have a little bit of fluid in the spinal cord, and this is just a prominent central canal. Uh, nobody knows what the incidence of this is because we don't just go out and image a lot of normal patients, but we see this every day. Another prominent central canal, this one is larger, but again, it's two or three, centi two, two or three millimeters and it's very small. It's not doing anything. There's a little bit of a disc protrusion and we see this association sometimes, but there's definitely no obstruction. Again, a prominent central canal. Uh, here's, here's a syrinx, and you can see the difference between this and what I just showed. There's, there's edges here, it's not very regular, it's larger. 
So this is a syrinx, and this also has a little web in it. This is another syrinx, and you can see it's much larger. It's actually deforming the posterior cord here. And this is a patient, again, with a Chiari 1 because the tectum isn't beaked. So another syrinx. And again, another syrinx. This is very large. Now it's actually doing something to the, to the parenchyma of the, of the spinal cord here. Okay. And this is what happens with a successful surgical cure. Very large syrinx. You can see how this extends all the way up and down the cervical and thoracic spine. And this is post-op, and, and it just goes away. This is a success. Okay. And just to, to show you that this is the spectrum of disease, this is a Chiari 3, and this is an encephalocele, and, and these, are, these are very, very rare. So a lot of people just show the same patient, the same person that they find in a book somewhere. And you can see the big gap in the calvarium, and uh, here you can see the gap. And you see this encephalocele with a brain just herniating out. And this brain is, is not salvageable, basically. The, once it comes out like that, it, it's, it's, it's not functioning. They're associated with large cysts sometimes. You, you can see that. This is, cyst is almost as big as the head. And again, they can be very small, but again, very devastating. And you can again see the, the syrinx. And so that's the spectrum of, of Chiari malformations. And a, a little bit about syringomyelia. And uh, I guess questions are later. So thank you.